Praise the Lord. Dr. Hanson, good evening to you. Good evening, Shannon. How are you all doing over there this evening? Well, we're good. We've got a live audience and we're ready to go. Fantastic. Everybody, welcome aboard. We're right on time tonight. We're excited to be here with World Ministries International, Dr. Jonathan Hansen and some guests this evening. Hope you'll invite someone to tune in. And uh, during this program, be sure and check out their website, worldministries.org. Dr. Hansen, would you like to open it up in prayer? And the mic is yours. Thank you. Father God, we come to you in the most precious name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We're grateful, dear God, for the opportunity to be on this program, OmegaManRadio.com, Lord, as well as being able to film it on Warning Television and Warning Radio, Shortwave, and social media. We're grateful for this opportunity to still be in this battle for freedom, to extend your gospel of Jesus Christ, to let the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the kingdom of God come on earth, to move with that authority that you possessed, so that again, we're walking epistles. Bless this program now, dear God, let everybody that watches it and listens to it, I pray that they'll be energized, they'll be committed, and they'll be engaged in this battle. In Jesus' name, amen. You're watching the Warning Television program. I'm also on OmegaManRadio.com. It's syndicated with Shannon Davis. Uh, this is, I'm his guest. And uh, you're also listening to the Warning Radio, tele, uh, shortwave radio, social media, things like this, that we're on all forms of of uh, media, podcast, just look at my website, www.worldministries.org, and you'll see the many different ways you can watch or listen. Now, I'm going to speak on great anointing, the power of testimonies. Carrie Judd Montgomery. Now, we need another great awakening. If we don't have another great awakening, our nation in America literally will not survive. We are falling apart right now, literally. We are being destroyed because the church is not engaged. Most of the church, I'll be very frank, they're lukewarm, they're backslidden. God is not happy with the church. Judgment is going to come on the church. Great anointing in the power of a testimony. America and the church need another great awakening. The church is very sick. Most Christians are no longer capable to deal with the sin and tyranny sweeping America because they have been part of the problem in America. They become part of it. They have diluted and compromised the word of God to include sins of abomination such as accepting or even ordaining homosexuals and lesbians as priests or pastors. These type of lukewarm Christians come to church, but live in cohabitation with fornicators and adulterers. They watch every type of filthy movie, TV program, pornography on the internet, or in magazines. These Christians are so far away from intimacy with God that they have no discernment and are under a spirit of deceivableness. So they gullibly obey the lies of the leader or political party that becomes the Hitler and the Nazis. They ignorantly, stupidly, and cowardly watch as the laws are changed which are unconstitutional and they have no spirit of the Lion of Judah in them to criticize, disobey, or resist tyranny taking place right in front of their eyes. They, like the Jews and Christians in Europe and Germany, who did not have the courage to be true ambassadors to speak against evil in every form, including policies and unconstitutional laws, or to flee when they had the time and warning to do so, instead became trapped arrested, and many rounded up and taken to concentration camps where millions died. The men and women who led the first and second great awakening were totally in love with Jesus. They were willing to deny themselves, <coughs> family, 
friends, businesses, and careers in pursuit and in service of God. They wanted to be filled with the third person of the Trinity, called the baptism of the Holy Ghost, so they could obey the Great Commission <clears throat> and make disciples in their nation, healing the sick, <clears throat> casting out demons, raising the dead. They wanted to truly be real ambassadors of Jesus Christ and were willing to tarry as commanded by the Lord when he ascended <clears throat> to obtain the power and authority needed to accomplish the tasks of being an ambassador. Today we're going to look at the life of Carrie Judd Montgomery, a real mover and shaker that was used in America's Great Awakening. Let's look at some text, text that all of these movers and shakers adhere to. They followed, they lived by it. Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus said, the first of all commandments is, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is the first commandment. And the second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other greater commandment than these. Love your God, love your neighbor. There it is, perfect unity. No problems. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus said and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We call that the Great Commission, our great assignment. But most Christians, they don't care about what this says. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. The only they th thing they go into is all the grocery stores, shopping centers, lattes. Do they go into all the world and preach the gospel? They don't even go to their neighbor. Luke 24, 47 through 53. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send you the promise of my father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to all of us that to pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are supposed to be partakers of his divine nature. The movers and shakers understood this. They literally became this. 
They moved with power and authority. They had such hunger and thirst that nothing mattered. They understood that the gospel had to preach for salvation to come or people were damned. They had a burden for the lost. Do we have a burden for the lost? What do we look forward to? What do we talk about? The next movie? The next football game? These people didn't care about that. They had hunger and thirst for righteousness, the will of God. They wanted nothing but to be filled with the third person of the Trinity. They wanted to be partakers of the divine nature. They wanted to move in power and authority. They wanted to speak in tongues. If a person is watching or listening out there and you've never spoken tongues and you don't care, God help your soul. If you think God is happy with you, he's not. He wants you to be a partaker of his divine nature. He wants you to move in the third person of the Trinity. That's why he died. That's why he gave you these commissions. Not so you sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. Number one. It takes intense spiritual hunger to have encounters with God. Intense spiritual hunger. Maria Judd Montgomery stated, quote, Now who is going to trust God for the winged life? You can crawl instead if you wish. God will bless you if you crawl. He will do his best he can for you. But how much better to avail ourselves the wonderful privilege in Christ and to mount up with wings as eagles, to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint, Oh, beloved friends, there is a life on wings. I feel the streams of his life fill me, permeate my mortal frame from head to feet until no words are adequate to describe it. I can only make a few bungling attempts to tell you what it is like and ask the Lord to reveal to you the rest. May he reveal to you your inheritance in Christ Jesus so that you will press on and get all that he has for you. Unquote. Man, she was an eagle. If she was alive, she'd be part of eagles saving nations. This is what she said. You should be able to fly on wings. Yeah, if you want to crawl. If you want to be a sparrow. It takes believers who will press into the supernatural lifestyle made available to every follower of Jesus to reveal these aspects of God's nature. Who will press into the supernatural lifestyle. Maria's spiritual hunger led her on journeys where she experienced God's presence in profound ways. Two, healing encounter. Maria grew up in an Episcopal church at 17. She said God wanted her to surrender all to him. She told the Lord she was going to keep her talent for writing tight. But she told the Lord if he wanted, he could tear her hands apart. Now that was a foolish statement. Shortly after her statement to God while walking to school, she slipped and fell hard on the icy ground. Maria's injuries from the fall turned into a disease, which developed into tuberculosis of the spine and of the blood. She was bedridden for two years with chronic pain. She couldn't even handle touch, sound, or light. Her sisters had already died of different diseases, and now her mother had called her friends to say their last goodbyes 
to Maria. Maria thought she had heard from God and that she still had a mission to complete for him. Maria's father read about a person who gave a testimony of being healed. And the Judd family sent a letter to the woman mentioned in the article for prayer for his daughter. African-American healing evangelist Sarah Mix responded with a letter on February 24, 1879. Okay, the power of a testimony. They read a testimony. Now they're reaching out for this person. Miss Carrie Judd, I received a line from your sister Eva stating your case, your disease, and your faith. I can encourage you by the word of God that according to your faith, so be it unto you. Besides, you have this promise. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise them up. Whether the person is present or absent, if it is the prayer of faith, it is all the same. And the God has promised to raise up the sick ones, and if they have committed sins, to forgive them. Now this promise is to you. And is if you were the only person on earth, that's the promise for you. Now if you can claim that promise, I have not the least doubt you'll be healed. You will have to lay hand. Lay aside all medicine of every description. Now, this would stop most people in the United States. Lay aside your medicine. Use no remedies of any kind. Some people, oop, that might stop them. No remedies. Lay aside trusting in the arms of the flesh. And lean wholly upon God and his promises. When you receive this letter, I want you to begin to pray for faith. And Wednesday afternoon, the female prayer meeting is at our house. We will make you a subject of prayer. Between the hours of three and four, I want you to pray for yourself. And pray believing that an act of faith will heal you. It makes no difference how you feel. But get right out of bed and begin to walk by faith. Strength will come, disease will depart, and you will be made whole. We read in the gospel, thy faith has made thee whole, unquote. Right soon, yours in faith, Mrs. Edward Mix. Did you hear that? I can already hear the murmurers and the complainers and, and murmuring going around. Well, I, can, I won't do it. No, and you might not be healed either. I understand this type of faith. My grandma had it. She was healed time and time again when they said she would die and they said their goodbyes. There's been times I have refused when they said I'd be dead by morning because I heard from God. Right now we got doctors and nurses and medicine and a lot of people won't step into this type of faith. That's why you're not a mover and shaker. Carrie followed the instructions in the letter. She prayed the prayer of faith found in James 5, got up from her bed, and was healed. Amen. They had come to say their goodbyes. She was on buku medicine, pharmaceuticals. Probably some family remedies too. Carrie's testimony was printed in the newspapers and the news of her healing spread as far as England. This happened during a time when the prevalent view in the church was that it was good to suffer even illness unto the Lord. You still have that among a lot of Christians. Because they don't know the prayer of faith. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in healing. They don't believe in speaking in tongues. So, just develop a good attitude as you suffer. That's the view of many Christians today. It's a pathetic view. It's a sick view. And you remain sick. But it was the prevalent view in the church at that time. 
Not many people at this time were praying and believing for healing, and her testimony of God healing her helped change that attitude among some. Three, foundations of her life now laid. Her first foundation at 22 in 1880 was her writing and publications. She released a book called The Prayer of Faith, which spread beyond the United States and was translated into French, Dutch, German, and Swedish. Thousands of people were healed by reading the book. The Prayer of Faith. Testimonials. I've heard some people, if a person gives a testimony, oh, you're bragging. People like that, it's because they don't have a testimony. They don't have a testimony to give. So if you have a testimony, you must be bragging. The whole Bible is a testimony. Amen. The whole Bible is written to inspire your faith. If you have a testimony, give it. We're supposed to have testimonies. If you don't have a testimony, I don't need to hear you speak. I don't need you to tell me stories out of the Bible. I can read. Do I hear an amen? Yeah. I want a testimony. You better have a testimony in your life. Thousands of people were healed by reading the book. In 1881, Carrie stepped out in faith to produce a periodical on healing and holiness called The Triumph of Faith. When she only had enough money to launch the first one. This monthly newsletter outlived Carrie and became a significant vehicle for spreading healing testimonies and revival fires around the world as well as empowering women in ministry. Triumph of faith. Her second foundation is shortly after her healing. She started on her ecumenical preaching career and shared her testimony of her healing at a local church. She just shared her testimony in the beginning. And the more she went into ministry, the more she stepped out in faith, the more her anointing increased and the more testimonies she had. That's the way it works. It's the law of sowing and reaping, of duplication, of the talents, of increase. Again, you sow the seed and what does it do? It grows. It produces more seed and more growth. That's the law of obedience. As we step out in faith, our anointing is activated. By 1883, she had already initiated Thursday night prayer meeting, Tuesday afternoon Bible studies, and once a month prayer meeting for missionaries. Carrie would later speak at conferences, conventions, camp meetings, and she was one of the first itinerant women to preach across North America. You know, some people... have a problem with women in ministry. You got a problem with the Bible then. Because if you read it, they were in ministry. They were in the extension of the kingdom of God, the obedience of God. Queen Esther, tremendous mover and shaker. I love women in ministry. I love people in ministry. I love my wife in ministry. Five, her third foundation is she opened Faith Sanctuary in 1880 in a room in her house that was set aside to pray for the sick. In 1882, Carrie stepped out in faith to open one of the earliest healing homes in America, which she called Faith Rest Cottage when she did not have enough money beyond the first few months. I love this. Stepping out in faith, having no money, then the money continues to come in. That's how we live at World Ministries International. 
They go to the post office expecting something to come in. Six, God speaks to us through testimonies. And every testimony brings something of heaven into the atmosphere. If you have a testimony, it brings something from heaven into the atmosphere. Carrie used hers and other people's testimonies of healing to inspire others to activate their faith. As God is no respecter of people, he shows no partiality. Acts 10, 44. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He shows no partiality. He's the same. Who he used in the past, he can use today in the present, and he will use in the future. If you have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you want all of God, if you lay other things aside, if you're willing to sacrifice your time, your energy, your resources. He said, I want to move like that. You can. But most people don't really want to bad enough. Carrie used hers and other people's testimonies to inspire others. And they were healed. Seven hunger produces an anointing encounter. Carrie continued to have an unquenchable hunger. Unquenchable is the word. Hunger for God. She couldn't get enough. I wish even all my staff were that way. Some will be here Saturday, but they're not here tonight. Anyway, don't tell me you love God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. I just don't believe it. These people were here night after night, day after day. That's not the American church we're used to sitting back, having a 15, 30 minute sermon out the door, rushing to some sports. And if you don't like sports, which they have every day of the year, then you run to the movie theater. You run somewhere, but probably don't run after God. Some people say, well, I don't like this preaching. Well, I don't care if you do or not. I really don't care. You're not a mover and shaker. I am, and I like it. I'm trying to get other people to be movers and shakers. You can do that. We need a great awakening. If the church won't wake up, it won't happen. You know, Jesus really didn't care if people liked his message. He preached the message. The apostles, the prophets really didn't care. The movers and shakers really didn't care. They just moved with God. Many followed and others. Instead of eagles became sparrows. Like she said, God will love you if you crawl. And a lot of them crawl to this day. They crawl. But that will not save America. We need people that are eagles. People that are flying with God. Soaring with God. Moving with the third person of the Trinity. We need people that have the boldness to confront sin and confront tyranny. That only comes with the power of God in you. Other people are laid back, don't care, or compromise and just follow. Right to the concentration camps. 
See, only in their deception they think it will never happen to me. And they sit back until the knock comes on their door. It happened, but it's too late. Carrie continued to have an unquenchable hunger for God. Her hunger for God caused her to know he wanted to get full control of her, filling her temple. Full control. That's what God really wants from you and I. He wants himself to be able to have full control in your mortal body to work through you so you can do miracles. She heard of people further east who had great anointing and she took a train to be with these people. Listen to this. She would go where the anointing was. She would go when people had more anointing than she did. She wanted it. She knew God was no respecter of people. After arriving at her sister's residence, she was advised by her motherly saint of God that her evening meal was about ready and Carrie said, oh, I do not want anything to eat. I want God. I've taken a lot of people on mission trips and normally that's not what I hear out of them. <laughs> They're anxious to eat. Carrie was left alone in a room waiting on God. And later this woman joined her. As they were together worshiping God, together worshiping God, she refused to eat, see. God manifested himself in a cloud of heavenly dew. Now she had traveled by train to get to this person. The point I'm making is how much she hungered for God. She did not come there to have a meal. She came there to touch God and to get what these people had. It says, God manifested himself in a cloud of heavenly dew, which descended gently upon my head and entered my being, taking full possession of me. At the same time, a sweet, restful feeling almost overpowered me so that my own strength somewhat left me and I leaned over and rested my head on this sister's shoulder. While waiting on the Lord for a few more days in this hallowed home, the manifestations of the Lord's presence was about me and within me and became still more glorious until my whole being seemed to be filled with rivers of living water. And Jesus himself revealed as the one among 10,000, the lily of the valley. This encounter with God left a greater anointing in Carrie's life. This happened because she had put everything <coughs> aside <coughs> and gone on a journey with only God focused on. She would not even eat. She wanted more of God. She wanted what these people had. In 1890, Carrie married businessman George Montgomery, who relocated her to Oakland, California. George had been healed under the ministry of John Alexander Dowie. In 1893, Carrie opened the first healing home on the West Coast called the Home of Peace which is still open today. Carrie also started healing and revival meetings in orphanages, missionary training schools, and homes for the minority. Eight, spirit baptism encounter, speaking in tongues. <clears throat> the Azusa Street Revival ignited by William J. Seymour, an African American in the early 1906 was known for people longing to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Carrie finally made it to a meeting and was impacted seeing a, a spirit-baptized girl shine in God's glory. 
carrying her own words. Quote, I had myself received marvelous anointing of the Holy Spirit in the past, but I felt there was more for me, and I surely wanted it. As I could not afford to miss any blessing that the Lord was pouring out in these last days, unquote. She had a mighty anointing, but she wanted more. In July 1907, one of Carrie's workers at the Home of Peace was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Then revival broke out among the children at her orphanage. Carrie wanted more, and because of these stirrings, sought others to pray for her. Note the humility. Now, she had done some great things already. Yet she wanted more and she sought others to pray for her. Some people don't think they need prayer by others. Not depends who prays for you. She sought people that had this anointing. It's like having a billy goat pray for you. You don't need to be a billy goat. In other words, if, if the person doesn't have anointing, I wouldn't go to that billy goat. Go to an eagle that has anointing, that moves in these gifts, that moves in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you want something higher than you possess. This caused Carrie to want even more of God. So she took a trip back east to pray about the signs related to the Pentecostal revival. She met with friends in Cleveland, Ohio, who spoke in tongues and urged them to pray with her. I hope you're noticing how she's crisscrossing. Not to minister. Sure, she did a lot of ministry, but she's wanting her own body anointed, filled with God. She wants what others have. And she will not be denied. If you're out there and you really want it bad enough, you won't be denied. If you're denied, you don't really want it bad enough. How can I say it dogmatically? Because it's in the Bible. It just depends how much you seek it, how much you want it, how much you covet it. Where are you willing to go? Are you willing to fast and pray? What are you willing to do? Now you can fool other people. Oh, I love God. But the fruit shows how much you love God. Where do you spend your time, your energy? It really shows. And it shows why you don't have something. She met with friends in Cleveland, Ohio, who spoke in tongues and urged them to pray with her. She wanted her tiny streams of the Spirit to burst into rivers of living water. She tried to go to a meeting where people were tarrying for the endowment from power from on high. Tarrying. If you're old-time Pentecost, I grew up in the Pentecostal pastor's home. My father focused on healing and evangelism, salvation, deliverance. His meetings, they would tarry around the altar for hours. In churches, if you weren't baptized in the Spirit, you would come night after night for hours. Not for hours watching the football game or the playoffs. Not for hours around the buffet. <laughs> Fitting your belly, the flesh. You went for hours praying. With others praying with you and for you and laying on a lawn of hands until you had a breakthrough. I remember those days. I lived them. That's how I was filled. Where are people taking the baptism seriously today? I don't see it. And that's why we're so pathetic. Other things are more important in our lives. And you can't look at me with a straight face and deny it. Other things are more important than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
than having a greater anointing, than having all of God, than being a partaker of the divine nature. We need a great awakening. She tried to go to meetings where people were tarrying for the endowment of power from on high. Those are the kind of meetings she went through. All this time, Carrie was becoming more and more filled with the power, anointing, and spirit of God, but was yet not able to speak in tongues. As you're on your journey, you are becoming more and more anointed, more and more powerful. You know, you have, you, sometimes a person receives Christ and sometimes speaks in tongues pretty fast. But that person doesn't move with a lot of power and authority. The only tongues you get is for yourself, to edify yourself. Power and authority comes as you continue with that in life of Christ, that personal relationship with God. As you want all of God, then your nature changes into the divine nature. Then the third person of the Trinity moves through you in powerful ways. Tongues is not an end all. It's a beginning. She was lacking it. She wanted it. She had been chasing God with all of her might for years and done great exploits. Because of the anointing, she did have. Because of the relationship with God, she did have. And tongues was just the frosting on the cake. Sure, with that relationship, it gave you more power and authority. The disciples walked with Christ, but they needed that baptism of the Holy Spirit to have more power and authority. They needed much more. Carrie wanted and needed, and we all need much more. We are way more powerful. She returned to Chicago to reunite with Lucy E. Simmons, a close friend who had received the fullness of the Spirit with the sign of speaking in tongues. They spent some time tarrying in the Lord's presence. Then something new happened to Carrie. She recorded the following account, quote, On Monday, June 29, less than a week from the time I first took my stand by faith, the mighty outpouring came upon me. I had said, I am all under the blood and under the oil. And then I began singing a little song. He gives me joy instead of sorrow. To my surprise, some of the words would stick in my throat as though the muscles tightened and would not let me utter them. I tried several times with the same results. Mrs. Simmons remarked that she thought the Lord was taking away my English tongue because he wanted me to speak in some other language. I replied, well, he says in Mark 16, 17, they shall speak with new tongues. So I take that too by faith. In a few moments, I uttered a few scattered words in an unknown tongue and then burst into a language and came pouring out in a great fluency and clearness. For nearly two hours, I spoke and sang in unknown tongues. There seemed to be three or four distinct languages. Some of the tunes were beautiful, most oriental. I tried, tried sometimes to say something in English, but the effort caused such distress in my throat and head, I had to stop after a few words and go back to the unknown tongue. I was filled with joy to be Thus, controlled by the Spirit of God and to feel that He was speaking heavenly mysteries through me was most delightful. Therefore, the rivers of living water flowed through me and divine ecstasy filled my soul. I felt I could drink and I used the life and power as fast as it was poured in. I became very weak physically under the greatness of the heavenly vision and I staggered when I tried to walk across the floor. 
And when the exhaustion became very great, dear Mrs. Simmons asked the Lord to strengthen me, which she did so sweetly, letting his rest and healing life possess my weary frame. Again, this reminds me. She was so weak under the great heaviness of what God was coming upon her and her visions. She staggered. I remember again in tomorrow, my oldest daughter in a crusade meeting I was holding in Africa and people were all over slain in the spirit and by the hours lying under the power of God on the floor. Tamar could not even get up and she was there probably seven or eight hours and finally I carried her out of the building and took her where we were staying and put her to bed. She was so under the power of God. Exhaustion. Mrs. Simmons would pray with her. Letting his rest and healing life possess my weary frame. She would ask the Lord to strengthen me. Again, I remember in Jamaica, the largest tent, 5,000. And after preaching, then for five hours praying for the sick, to the point I was hurting because virtue was coming out of me and I, I was hurting. My body was hurting to lay hands on people. I would kneel down and the people around me, my, my staff would pray for me. Dr. Mike, who was with me, said, Pastor, you better quit. You're going to die. Because I, he knew I was on a, I had been preaching heavy for two weeks. I preached a heavy message in the morning and we drove that whole day and, that, and into the evening to get there. We came in late and then I preached several hours and then five hours preaching and praying for people. But I said I couldn't quit because everybody was healed. Every single person. I've never seen that. The blind, the lame, they were healed. Blind eyes open, water would gush out. They could see perfectly. So I said, I can't quit. Can't you see everyone's healed? And I would sit down, kneel down, and they would pray for me. I'd get up and do it again. We're in mortal bodies. We're not God, although God works through us. But our teammates, the church, prays for us. That's the point of the church. They pray for you. They encourage you. They're there for you. There's no substitution by watching it on television. Watching something on television is an addition. But don't let them try to control and kill the church by closing it down. This is tyranny what they're doing in the United States. 30% of the church will never open again. They want to destroy the church. We need the support of one another. We need their prayers. We need their encouragement. Just like in the Old West, when the wagons stayed together and they circled the wagons, they could survive an attack. When they were separated, they were killed. We need one another. You need to attend a good church. <clears throat> Soon she had a vision of the work of Christ and the cross as never before. These encounters changed Carrie and continued to change her where she moved into a deeper anointing, a deeper revelation, a deeper understanding. Or again, the divine nature continued to become stronger and stronger in her. After spirit baptism, Carrie always went after more of the spirit. By covenant in Christ, 
Everything is already given to us. So we simply need to take hold of what already is in our spiritual accounts. This Carrie learned to do. Carrie's spirit baptism encounters touched her deeply. She received a multiplication of joy, power to witness, teachability, a hunger for the word of God, and the freedom of mind from all cares. Carrie sought to impart her encounter so that others would become blessed. Upon hearing of Carrie's spirit baptism experience, many evangelical missionaries were baptized in the spirit and many spoke in tongues. Additionally, Carrie wrote about her encounters in her monthly newsletter, and she created space for others to share their testimonies of spirit baptism. Again, the power of the testimony. People continued to read it, people wanted it, people received it, and it just continued. There's no boasting here. It's an experience of the supernatural coming to pass in somebody's life and they're sharing it. And God uses that to create hunger in others to want it so they can move in the supernatural. The power of the testimony, if you have one. This released a widespread hunger for the Pentecostal spirit baptism across denominations and around the world. Carrie's encounter especially impacted apostolic leaders. And she helped many, like Amy Simple McPherson, who called the Mexican Bill Sunday Francisco Elzebal. Carrie's husband led him to the Lord, and Carrie introduced him to divine healing. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. He went on to preach to over 250,000 people and plant 10 denominations, both Protestant and Pentecostal. Further, Smith Wigglesworth, Alexander Boddy, other significant Pentecostal leaders partnered with Carey in 1914 in a worldwide camp meeting where they invited many to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in Pentecostal fullness. Acts 2, 4. Legacy. Carrie remained in a place of humility, which allowed her to be a bridge between the evangelicals and Pentecostals. Humility. Her humility allowed her to venture outside what was safe and venture to outside areas to seek more of God, asking others who had experienced a similar breakthrough or encounter or experience from God to help her and pray for her as she was seeking all of God possible. She was humble enough to continue to seek, 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 and ask others to help her receive. That same humility that she crisscrossed America seeking for more of God was why she could pull denominations together. Because of her humility. If a person is too proud, then they stay separated. They don't want to reach across denominational lines. They don't even want to try. Worship, prayer, and waiting on God were consistent features of the process by which she reached out to God. Distractions were removed. Time was set aside, and there was a cost. We must have one ambition, she said, and that is to know him. Each of Carrie's encounter propelled her further into her destiny. As she continued and continued to be receiving the impartations and the anointings and the visions and the dreams, the experiences by the Holy Spirit, it propelled her further into her destiny. She was now more qualified than she was before to help other people. We must contend for 
divine encounters. We must contend for them. If you don't want them, you probably won't get them. I know my wife wouldn't want me to say this, but I know she fasts a lot. She wants more divine encounters, more revelations, more visions, more dreams. She contends for it. If you don't contend for it, that's probably why you don't have too much. What do you contend for? What's important to you? She did not care about receiving the glory. She reached out to other leaders and supported them, not wanting for them or waiting for them to come to her. She didn't wait for them to come. She sought after them. Carrie moved toward others, looking for common ground, honoring other people, their place in God. Consequently, unity becomes possible to the degree that others show us respect. Carrie saw the value in other movements. Carrie never taught about or tried to defend being a woman in ministry. She simply did the things God called her to do. She resisted the temptation to pick up the debate about women in ministry. She also chose not to live in reaction to others. I hope you heard these things. She didn't want to debate it. She just lived her life. She chose not to live in reaction to others. She didn't need to defend herself or her position in ministry. She was doing the gospel and living the ministry. The fruit defended itself. Conclusion. Because God does not show partiality, he is really the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we have seen him do in the past creates a momentum for us to experience him in the present day. It just takes someone to recognize the living reality that exists in a testimony and to put a demand on the power it carries. Carrie Judd Montgomery modeled this response very well. She not only benefited from the testimony of others, she also became the source of the testimony of miracles that created faith in her hearers, positioning her to give away what God had given to her. Again, after Carrie was baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues, Carrie immediately started to minister to others who were looking for the same outcome. Genuine experiences in God equip us to give away what we've received. This is evidence of real biblical authority. Those called by God to serve the body of Christ are to do so to equip their fellow believers for service. But this is not so that everyone will merely receive and depend on their gift. The generals are made visible so that as they equip others, what was once the high water mark of a highly gifted person will become the norm as people are equipped and released. I try to release others. I don't want to just do the work of the ministry and say, watch me. This is the way Carrie Judd Montgomery was able to multiply herself over and over again throughout her lifetime by equipping others, by giving it away. Many, many leaders benefited from the grace she carried. Those whom she served became the faces that revival historians remember, but heaven remembers Carrie. Elijah's anointing is what John the Baptist operated in. As a result, he was called the greatest of all prophets. Why did John not walk in the spirit and power of Elisha rather than Elijah? Because Elisha had twice the anointing and measure of breakthroughs as Elijah. It was because Elisha walked into the momentum created by Elijah. Heaven gives honor to the ones who blaze the original trail and become a fountain of life for others to benefit from. Carrie lived outside the box. She succeeded in ignoring what others might have thought was a strike against her as a woman. And she lived her life to the fullest. Carrie did not allow society or even the church keep her from her destiny. 
Both resisted women in ministry and speaking in tongues, but Carrie continued to serve God faithfully, ministering in the gospel and encouraging others to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. She knew this is where the power came from to fulfill the Great Commission. Hunger moves people and moves them to take great risks, giving no thought what others might think. Hunger and humility is what God is looking for, what causes God to use that person with his divine abilities. The generals in God's army modeled great humility, and God gave them his grace, meaning his empowering presence that enables us to do what God can do and only God can do. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5. To save America, we need another great awakening. This will only happen when Christians hunger for God with all their being and are filled with the third person of the Trinity. This is why you need to join Eagles Saving Nations to spark a revival that can shake this nation and awaken the church back to its first love. We need another great awakening, ladies and gentlemen. We need the power of God to flow through us. And that's what Eagle Saving Nations is all about. To stop this tyranny that's trying to topple the Republic of the United States of America. If you want to join Eagle Saving Nations, and I hope every one of you does, go to my website, www.worldministries.org. That's www.worldministries.org. You'll see Eagle Saving Nations on the website. Click it. You'll see the vision statement, the mission statement, the membership statement, statement of faith. Sign it. Become a member of Eagle Saving Nations. We need another great awakening. The website again, www.worldministries.org. We kicked it off today. You need to be a member. Go on my website, www.worldministries.org and become a member of Eagles Saving Nations. We need a great awakening. We need a great revival. We need a baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity flowing through you and I. We need, again, a revival to take place in America. God help us. God help the church. www.worldministries.org Eagles Saving Nations. Become a member today. My phone number 360-629-5248. 360-629-5248. Shannon? What a powerful word today, Brother Hanson. What would you like to title this for the archives? Great anointing, the power of testimonies. Kerry Judd Montgomery. Thank you for allowing us to be part of this today. Powerful word. We'll see you again next time, Dr. Hanson. God bless you, you Shannon. God bless you.